Well, good morning. I'd like you to turn, please, to the book of Revelation once again in chapter 16. And we're going to read uh, from verse 10 to the end of the chapter. And we're going to be focusing our attention particularly on God turning up the heat on the beast. <laughs> uh, we're going to be looking at the direct war with the beast. Uh, and we're going to see that in this uh, these remaining bold judgments. So verse 10 it says, and the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain, and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and repented not of their deeds. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air. And there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not, since men were upon the earth. So mighty an earthquake, and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God, because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. And again, God will bless that reading of his precious word to us. We said that this is God, as it were, turning up the heat on the beast. And what we've been saying as we've gone through uh, these judgments in the book of Revelation is that invariably there are seven, but they are always in fours and threes. And so once again, we find this pattern continuing so if you remember just a quick review when we did the six uh the seal judgments we noticed that of the seven the first four were horsemen of the apocalypse but the last three were not and so they were clearly four and three and then we looked at the trumpets and there were seven trumpet judgments but the last three of them were also called woes woe judgments so there's seven but they're distinguished between four just ordinary trumpet judgments three that are woe judgments and once again this pattern continues we see these bold judgments and again there's a four and a three and the final three uh, bull five bull six bull seven are all directed specifically to the kingdom of the beast and so for instance uh, we'll observe in uh, verses 10 and 11, uh, it says the, the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast or the throne of the beast. And so this bowl is directed specifically to the throne of the beast, or what we might say the kingdom of the beast is, is the object of this particular bowl judgment. Uh, bowl six what we're going to see, again, is God is going to disclose to us the uh, the power of the beast. And, uh, we, you know, can he remember the beast has stood in the temple and proclaimed himself to be God. And yet what God is going to do in verses 12 through 16 is he is going to reveal that actually this is not God, but this is somebody who is demonically and satanically 
controlled. And so we see that in verse 13, I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the false prophet. And so the, as it were, the true power of the beast is disclosed. He's not God. He's not uh, and not divine, but, but he's demonic. And uh, that's going to be revealed very clearly. And then bowl seven, the capital of the beast is going to be destroyed. And we see that in verse 19, that the great city was divided into three parts and the cities of the nations fell and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And so a great earthquake and perhaps the epicenter of it will be the very uh, capital of the beast, Babylon. So we're going to look at uh, these things together this morning. So we begin with uh, verse 10 and this fifth angel pouring out his bowl upon the seat. Or the, it's the same word that throughout is translated seat in the King James, but other translations have throne, the throne of the beast. Again, remind, we're reminded that these are literal plagues. Uh, we're reminded that these plagues, some of them have occurred before in the plagues in Egypt. And so there's there's a lot of parallelism, and we've tried to point out uh, the parallels in the book of Exodus. And so we want to do that once again. If we turn back to the book of Exodus in chapter 10, uh, we will see uh, that there was a time in the plagues of Egypt where darkness, a darkness that was so real that it could be felt. We break in in verse 21 of Exodus chapter 10, Exodus 10, verse 21. The Lord said to Moses, stretch out thine hand toward heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even darkness which may be felt. And Moses stretched forth his hand uh, toward uh, heaven, and there was thick darkness in all the land of Egypt. They saw not one another, Neither rose any from his place for three days, but all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. Of course, in Exodus, um, the the background is is God really declaring war with the gods of Egypt, and uh, one of the gods of Egypt was the sun god Ra, and the ninth plague of Egypt was literal darkness to show God's power even over the sun, which they elevated and worshipped. And, and uh, again, that, that sun is under the divine control. And so it was literal darkness in Egypt, and we believe it will be a literal darkness uh, in the book of Revelation, a literal plague. Uh, again, a literal darkness with spiritual overtones. It could be felt as we saw there in uh, Exodus uh, chapter 10 and verse 22. And so, again, God is showing them the folly of choosing darkness rather than light. Do you remember John 3, 19, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. And so God gives them a taste of things to come because they're, in a sense, um, they're on the on the verge of eternity, and what will be their experience in eternity? Well, they're going to experience the the blackness of darkness forever. They're going to be cast into outer darkness, and now, as it were, they're getting a taste of things to come, or oh, the serious consequences of rejecting light. You reject light, you get darkness. And oh, how great that darkness will be. Now, whether, again, just as in Exodus, there was a distinction uh, between the Israelites. Remember, there was light in their dwellings, and yet um, there was darkness over all the land of Egypt. Could we suggest that the same thing may occur again? However, the problem is that the, the beast, the kingdoms of the beast is worldwide. <laughs> and, and so perhaps... Uh, the only bits of light might be uh, the place where Israel have fled. Uh, remember, in, in the wilderness, maybe that would be the only place where there's any light in their dwellings. But everywhere else over the earth will be dark. I'm also reminded, remember we saw some foreshadowings of Calvary because the, the ultimate light that has been rejected is the light of Calvary. And remember that the Lord Jesus 
during his substitutionary work where the wrath of God was poured out on him, we're told that there was darkness over the whole earth uh, in those three hours that the Lord Jesus suffered. And again, what a consequence that they have rejected the one that endured that uh, darkness of divine judgment so that they might be saved. And they have rejected this marvelous light. So the kingdom of the beast is full of darkness. But we had seen in chapter 15 that the temple in heaven is filled with the glory of God. <laughs> and here the kingdom of the beast is full of darkness. Now think about it just for a moment. Again, sometimes it's good just to try and imagine. These people are suffering. Those that have taken the mark and have followed the beast, they, there's a cum cumulative effect of all this. Uh, they've still got pain because of the uh, the you remember this the the terrible sores that came upon them uh, because they'd received the mark of the beast and so they're still suffering from that and then they've been scorched with heat and there's no means to cool off the the the, the fresh water supply is turned to blood and now they're plunged into darkness. And again, you can just imagine that in that darkness, just like in Egypt during that time of darkness, um, all you can focus on is not what you can see, but what you can feel. And what can they feel? Intense agony and pain and suffering. And they are going to be so conscious of it because there's nothing to distract them, nothing to take their eyes away from what they're going through. And so they're suffering tremendously. And sometimes it's interesting how I remember when we were at the at the kind of worst of our COVID, uh, we'd look at YouTube and we'd be watching stuff that was just, it wasn't evil, but it was just nonsense, really. But it was just to take our minds off the miserable way we were feeling. But there's nothing to take their minds off the way they're feeling, nothing to distract them. Just darkness added to the suffering that they are going through. And yet, as a result of all this, is there any evidence of repentance? Well, no, not a hint, because it says they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores. And uh, the <laughs> which had power over these plagues and they repented not to give him glory. I want you to notice now that all kind of attempts to uh, blame it on natural occurrences or natural phenomenon is gone. The people know who's responsible and they are blaspheming the name of God and they recognize that he is the one who has power over these plagues. And yet they still repented not to give him glory. And again, this just shows the intransigence of the heart of man that that, you know, we sometimes say, well, you know, if God would zap a few people, maybe they'd take things seriously, but that's not the way it works. <laughs> and even when God does bring judgment, whether it's temporal or otherwise, sadly, it doesn't seem to uh, cause people to, to learn the lesson and they continue on in their folly. So now we come to this sounding of the sixth angel. Yeah, it says they 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 blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains, their sores, they repented not of their deeds. The sixth angel poured out his vial, verse 12, upon the great river Euphrates, and the waters thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. So this sixth bowl. Remember that in the sixth trumpet, a powerful army was mobilized, but nothing was revealed as to its purpose or intent. But now all is about to be made plain. And so... The sixth bowl, once again, involves the Euphrates River, as does the sixth trumpet. Let's just look back at chapter 9 and verse 14. 
just to be reminded of that, chapter 9, verse 14, saying to the sixth angel which had the trumpet, loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. The four angels were loose, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay a third part of men. And the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000 thousand, and I heard the number of them. And so we saw that uh, that in the first incidents, the trumpet blowing, um, both judgments deal with demonically inspired military forces. The army of 200 million men in chapter 9, verse 16, who kill a third part of humankind. And then this army in verses 12 through 14, where we have the bull judgment, this is an army that is particularly intent on making war against God to do a battle against God, to come to this great battle of the God Almighty, the great day of God Almighty. So the first army was mustered, but now the purpose is revealed. It's mustered for one reason, and that reason is that it's going to join the man of sin, and there is going to be a united effort to fight against God and to destroy the God who has brought these plagues now why is all this first of all why is it necessary for the euphrates to be dried up well, part of the reason is remember what's just happened to the oceans the ocean waters have been turned to blood remember this this coagulation of the ocean waters and so it would make transportation of foreign troops into the middle east almost impossible by sea oftentimes armies are moved by sea remember the uh, the invasion of europe on d-day and that great armada that brought all the troops uh, well that will not be available and so now a, a new way of moving troops into the middle east is made possible because the the euphrates river now again this this river, 1,780 miles long or 2,864 kilometers long, is going to be dried up. What is interesting is that uh, you keep seeing news feed on, on YouTube of pictures of the Euphrates right now drying up. But again, that's not what's going to, that will be, it'll be totally dried up when the Lord does it uh, to make, but it's kind of a foreshadowing. These things are coming and they're coming very soon. Uh, this river stretches from the mountains of Turkey uh, all the way down to the Persian Gulf uh, and will now at this stage be completely dry ground, sufficient for this great crossing. Just as the Jordan was dried up so Israel could cross to go into the land uh, to, to conquer it the first time, now another force is going to come with a dried up Euphrates and they're going to set out to uh, bring their military might to join with the man of sin. Now, sometimes you've heard prophetic prophetic preachers talk about the fact that uh, these kings of the East actually come to fight against Antichrist and and, uh, and the man of sin, and there's kind of this, this idea of a war, a global conflict, and then suddenly they join forces and they make war against God. And yet there's no hint here that they're coming to attack the man of sin. In fact, it would seem that because this, this man of sin, his, his kingdom is worldwide, uh, they're actually coming in support of the man of sin. And so the military might of countries like India and China and Japan now join him in annihilating the God of these agonizing plagues. And the transport by land is now a possibility. Verse 13, he tells us, I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the false prophets. Interesting that when the Lord Jesus, the true Messiah, came, he expelled unclean spirits. But his enemies send them forth. <laughs> they actually come out of them. Uh, and again, it's interesting that they're frogs. It says uh, unclean spirits like frogs. And again, what a picture. Uh, a devastating caric caricature of the failure of evil. That which men most 
uh, fear most because it appears to be mighty. And and what is it? Uh, a creature of the night called a frog. Not exactly the most scary thing <laughs> that you could imagine. And yet here it is, this ridic ridiculous uh, caricature. And again, we want to just say this, that everything is really in God's control. They think that God, the demons are going to bring these armies to this battle. Uh, but we, we need to remind ourselves that God is actually the one who is in control. And, and let's just see this. We want to see this, this great battle that they're being brought to, which we know as Armageddon, that we have in the Old Testament, clear evidence that God is the one who is going to bring this about. So I'd like us to look at the minor prophets in the books of Joel and Zephaniah. And so we, we look at Joel chapter 3, verse 2, and we just notice what God says here. I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat, and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. By the way, part of what God's controversy with the nations is they're always wanting to divide up the land of Israel. Isn't that interesting that a lot of political uh, uh, attempts are made to bring peace in the Middle East, and always it seems that Part of that is a two-state solution, dividing up God's land that he's given to the nation of Israel. But for our purposes here, I just want you to notice who is going to gather all the nations. I will also gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Now look at Zephaniah, please, chapter 3, verse 8. Chapter 3, verse 8 of Zephaniah where we read this, therefore, wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey for my determination. Notice that for my determination is to gather the nations that I may assemble the kingdoms to pour upon them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger for all the earth shall be devoured with fire, with the fire of my jealousy. And so again, notice it's God determining, my determination. The beast thinks that he is doing this by using these demonic spirits, but we know that actually, ultimately, this is God's purpose. So how is how is it that God is using the demonic spirits to accomplish his purposes? Uh, again, we, we've talked about this demonism disclosed, uh, and again, we've said this before, but... Um, everything's going to be out in the open. It's going to be very clear, you know, kind of the spirit world is very real, but this, the secular mind today doesn't have any time for the spirit world and they deny the reality of it. But the book of revelation, notice angels, demons, the spirit world is kind of very much, the veil is pulled back. We're seeing the real spirit world at work, but I want us to go back to a story in first Kings to see now, God is even able to use uh, demonic spirits to accomplish his purposes. And it's a pretty obscure little story, but it's one that I think is very relevant to what we're considering. And that's in 1 Kings 22. 1 Kings 22. And we're going to look at verses 19 through 23. 1 Kings 22. It says, he said here... Thou therefore the word of the Lord, I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, and all the hosts of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, Who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said on this manner, another said on that manner. Therefore came forth a spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said unto him, Wherewith? And he said, I will go forth, and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, Thou shalt persuade him, and prevail also. Go forth and do so. So again, we might say, again, the angelic and, and, and even the demonic spirits can only act with divine permission. <laughs> Satan's on a leash. He can only do what God allows him to do. 
And so, again, God's able to make the wrath of man to praise him. He's even able to use the demonic uh, to accomplish his purposes. <clears throat> and so, how is all this going to work? Well, certainly, there's going to be great deception involved using signs. Notice he says, verse 13 of Revelation 16 again, I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the false prophet, for they are the spirits of devils. And notice how they do their work. Working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. So there's going to be great deception. There's going to be signs. There's going to be miracles that will persuade the kings of the whole world to gather for this battle against God. Now again, we've got to think about this because back in chapter 6 of Revelation, just as things were beginning, the seal judgments, uh, we saw in verses 15 and 16, it says, uh, chapter 6, verse 15, the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us, hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. So we find in chapter 6, they're cowering in fear. They're hiding in the rocks. And now somehow they're going to be persuaded, hey, we can do this. We can actually defeat God. We can actually make war against the Lamb. And they obviously believe they have a chance of winning. And so what's brought about the change? How are they now willing to wage war against God? The difference seems to be their confidence in the power of the beast. Remember, uh, after, after the killing, of the two witnesses. Do you remember that? The, the, the message went out, who is able to make war with him? And so perhaps the defeat of the two witnesses, their death, even though the Lord rose them from the dead in a very spectacular way, maybe that was sufficient to cause the, the, the armies of the world to think that they might have a chance to make war with God. Because who by the way, can make war with him, with the beast. So these miracle-working demons will convince the political leaders of the earth that by joining forces with the man of sin, victory over this, in their minds, this evil spiritual entity behind these devastating and painful plagues can be realized. They, they will be reminded vehemently of the man of sin's victory over the two witnesses who plague the earth, and that their assistance in victory over God himself is now within reach. And again, you think about the ultimate lie. We've been talking about this being a day of deception, and men will believe the lie, but perhaps the ultimate lie that they'll believe is that we can actually overthrow God. We can actually be done with this uh, this this global spoil sport who wants us to live holy lives when we want to live lives of decadence and sin. No chance. Uh, we can win this. We can win this. We believe the man of sin is our champion. Uh, he can help us overcome him. And so these spirits of demons, uh, they, they bring them to the battle of Armageddon, verse 16, he gathered them together to a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. By the way, Armageddon, is, it's literally Har-Megiddo, and it means the mountain of slaughter, and surely it is going to be a slaughter. And notice uh, the, the language here. Uh, again, it says, verse 14, they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and to, of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Already, the winner of the battle is apparent. It's the battle of the great day of God Almighty. It's not the great day of man. It's not the great day of the man of sin. It's not the great day of the dragon. They are being brought together for the great day of God Almighty. 
and he is going to be the undisputed winner on this this battle of all battles but interspersed between verse 14 and this great day of god almighty and verse 16 gathering them together to a place called the hebrew tongue armageddon we have another one of these beatitudes and it's a, again a little warning he says in verse 15 behold i come as a thief speaking to the faithful remnant that will still be uh, seeking to live for god at this difficult hour behold i come as a thief blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments lest he walk naked and they see his shame so again this is this blessed this beatitude third of seven beatitudes in the book of revelation remember we we often think of the beatitudes in matthew uh, chapter five but uh, there are seven of them in here in the revelation we've already seen uh, blessed is he that readeth and 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 keepeth the words of this prophecy in chapter one verse three we saw in chapter 14 verse 13 blessed are they that die in the lord from now on uh, the, the death of the martyrs uh, we see it here we see it in chapter 19 and verse 9, where we read, He said unto me, Right blessed are they that are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And then in chapter 20 and verse 6, Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. It says, On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and reign with him a thousand years. Chapter 22. And verse 7, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Verse 14, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they might have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. And so in the midst of tremendous judgment, here are these beatitudes. Blessed, oh, how incredibly happy is the man. How happy is the man? At this point in history, dark as it is, as deceptive as it is, blessed is the man that watcheth and keeps his garments. Uh, he he watches and he's, he's ready for the return of the Lord Jesus. He's holding tight to their robes of holiness, no matter how difficult the circumstances may be. And again, isn't there a warning for us who are waiting for the rapture of the church? First John chapter two, verse 28. We don't want to be those that are ashamed at his coming. He that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. And so we want to make sure that when the Lord comes for us, maybe today, who knows, could be today, that, that we're found walking in a way that we will not be ashamed before him at his coming. No matter how deceptive the day, no matter how difficult the temptations are, that would be those that are found walking in holiness, uh, in purity, purifying ourselves even as he is pure. The armies of the east are coming to Armageddon, but we're reminded here, even so the Lord Jesus is coming. Behold, I come as a thief. <laughs> yeah, these armies are coming, but I'm coming. You just hold on tight. You stay faithful. You stay loyal to me, despite the, the temptations and the difficulties in this very challenging hour in world history. And so verse 16, he says, he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. It's amazing that this place, the, uh, the Valley of Megiddo, is a region frequently associated with decisive battles. It's there that Deborah and Barak experience victory over Sisera back in the book of Judges and chapter 5. This is one of the earliest scriptural recordings of a battle taking place there. And Judges chapter 5 and verse 19, it says, he said unto her, give me, I pray, huh? that's chapter 4, chapter 5, verse 19, there we go. The kings came and fought then fought the kings of Canaan in Tanakh by the waters of Megiddo. They took no gain of money. So again, this great battle by the waters of Megiddo, the valley of, of Megiddo. This is a place of great victories. Gideon won his victory over the Midianites in Judges 7, the same place. Uh, Pharaoh, uh, if you remember, uh, killed King Josiah 
in 2 Kings 23, verse 29, again, in the Valley of Megiddo. Uh, and it's also the place of end time mourning. Uh, if you look at Zechariah, where when Israel realize that they have crucified their own Messiah, they will mourn just as the mourning was found for, for the, the, the death of King Josiah. Chapter 12 and verse 11, it says, in that day shall there be great mourning in Jerusalem and as the mourning of Hadadrimen in the valley of Negidon. And so, again, very significant place, this vast valley of Megiddo. It has seen tremendous battles through the centuries. Over 200 battles have been fought in that region. The first recorded one was recorded in 1468 BC with Pharaoh Tuthmosis III, and the last one recorded was in 1917 when Lord Allenby of the British defeated the Ottoman Empire there. And so, again, the scene of tremendous battles. In fact, in 1799, Napoleon fought near here, and he called it the most natural battleground of the whole earth. And really it is. And it's going to see the greatest battle in human history. Uh, that great battle between the beast and the armies of the earth and the Lord Jesus who's going to come from heaven and defeat them there. The great battle of God Almighty. So that leads us to bowl number seven. And we'll notice in bowl number seven, Verse 17, and the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, it is done. Now, I want you to notice several things here. First of all, notice where this bowl is poured out. Notice it says, it was poured his vial into the air. We know how our enemy, what's one of his titles? He is the prince of the power of the air. And this last bowl is poured out into the air. And again, directed against him and his puppets and his allies. And then a voice once again is heard. And again, we, we believe this great voice is none other than the voice that once before cried out on Calvary, it is finished. And now once again, he cries out, it is done. In other words, God's wrath that had been poured out on the Son of God in those three hours of darkness. And at the end of that darkness, there's this cry, it is finished. It's done. He's accomplished the work of redemption. And now it is done. He's accomplished the work of these judgments that he opened at the first seal. And now the last trumpet is sounded. And ultimately, the enemies are going to be absolutely decimated by this final outpouring of the wrath of God. It is done. Verse 18, and there was voices and thunders and lightnings. And we've seen that the throne is the throne of judgment, not a throne of grace anymore. Thunders voices thunders lightnings and then it says there was a great earthquake and then it distinguishes this earthquake from any other earthquake that has ever ever occurred it says there was a great earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth so mighty an earthquake and so great so this is the ultimate earthquake the earthquake of all earthquakes now revelation has already seen its fair share of earthquakes. And if we look back, we're just going to quickly run through the earthquakes in the book of Revelation, chapter 6, during the first judgments, the seal judgments, verse 12, I beheld, and he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. So the first one recorded there, chapter 6, verse 12, chapter 8, 
and verse 5. It says, The angel took the censer and filled it with the fire of the altar and cast it to the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. Chapter 11 and verse 13. At the death of the witnesses, two witnesses, it says, The same hour was there a great earthquake. And the tenth part of the city fell, and in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were affrighted, and gave glory to the God of heaven. Chapter 11, verse 19, the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in the temple uh, the ark of his testament. There were lightnings, and voices, and thunderings, and an earthquake, and great hail. But now we come to the ultimate earthquake. A great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake, and so great. Remember we said this is a great chapter. It's full of the description, great. And uh, we see it again, great, great earthquake. And notice the impact of this earthquake. And by the way, the great earthquake, remember, was linked with the statement it is done. Do you remember when the Lord Jesus cried out on Calvary? It is finished. Remember what happened then? Do you remember the veil of the temple was torn from the top to the bottom? And it says there was a great earthquake. <laughs> and now again, it is done. And there's a great earthquake. And so very, very similar here. Notice the effects of this earthquake. It said the great city was divided into three parts. Now, again, back to chapter 11, verse 8. That great city that's divided is none other than Jerusalem. And again, at this point, remember, Jerusalem is the religious capital of the beast. Remember, this is where the, the abomination of desolation is set up in the holy place. So this is, remember we said these judgments are directed specifically against the, the kingdom of the beast. So here, his religious capital is affected by a great earthquake. Uh, chapter 11, verse 8, their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. So again, back in chapter 16, the great city was divided into three parts. So, again, the three-part division of the city of Jerusalem as a result of this great earthquake, where the kingdom of the beast's religious capital is. And then it says, and again, it just almost, you know, it's, I love these little statements, you know, you might like the one, he made the stars also, just almost like a throwaway statement. And yet here he just simply says this, and the cities of the nations fell. Now, easy to say those few words, just think of the devastation that will be caused by this earthquake when it says the cities, plural, of the nations fell. Places like Delhi in India, these mega cities, New York, Montreal, Toronto. I mean, just the city, Halifax, Nova Scotia, all the cities of the nations, without exception, they fell. What devastation. Even already 50% of the world population is gone. Imagine how many deaths there will be in this greatest earthquake of all time. And as a result of it, the cities of the nations fell. And then it says, and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath and so, again, let me just say this. I believe that there is a religious capital of the beast, Jerusalem, but I also believe that there will be a commercial and political capital of the beast that will be rebuilt in the last days called Babylon. Now, why do I say that? If there's a literal earthquake that is going to devastate the cities of the world, and great Babylon came in remembrance before God, you would think that there has to be a literal city of Babylon rebuilt for that city to come in remembrance before God and also suffer as a result of this earthquake. 
And so it would seem to me that there will be a rebuilt economic and political capital of the beast called Babylon. And there will be a religious capital, which will be Jerusalem. And they both will suffer as a result of the earthquake. Great Babylon, that great city of Babylon, seems to be the epicenter of the most destructive earthquake the world will ever see. Now, it seems to be worldwide. We said it's wreaking havoc on the cities of the nation. But Babylon has not been forgotten before God. Now, again, we've mentioned Babylon before. Uh, it's been mentioned. We just maybe look at some of the references. But in chapter 14, verse 8, we saw this. Uh, there, there follows another angel saying, Babylon has fallen, has fallen that great city because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Chapter 14, it's already prefigured that's going to happen. Chapter 16 shows how it will happen, but it's, it's certainly going to happen. Chapter 14, verse 10. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be, and he shall be tormented, so on and so forth. So again, the same Babylon will drink of the wrath. And so certainly it is going to be a rebuilt ancient city. Now, let me just say this, that there are other opinions about this. Some believe that Babylon may refer to the literal rebuilt ancient city. I believe that personally. It may be also, some believe, a code word for Rome. <laughs> some believe that. Uh, or it may be, some even have suggested, just a proud human society that attempts to exist apart from God. But the reason that I believe it will be a literal city is because we already mentioned that great city Babylon was mentioned in chapter 14 and verse um, 8. Babylon has fallen, that great city. Here, this great earthquake is what produces that destruction. And again, it's a literal earthquake, which is destroying literal cities. And I believe Babylon will be one of those cities that will be destroyed. So again, just remind us of this. What is this all going to look like? And again, can you imagine? Whenever there is a massive earthquake, it always hits the news headlines. And usually if there's an earthquake in one place, you know, as the earth plates move, there's one somewhere else as well. Usually one sparks off another. But this is going to be worldwide. But primarily uh, the great city of Jerusalem and great Babylon come in remembrance before God. But all the cities, London, Paris, Tokyo, New York, Toronto, all of them destroyed. Uh, imagine what a colossal display of God's wrath against sinful mankind. The cities that men have built reduced to pieces of rubble. And again, so much of city uh, landscape is glory to man. The big skyscrapers, the big, uh, you know, kind of memorials to men, the statues, all of it, the great cities of the nations fell. And verse 20 Every island fled away. So this, these, this earthquake is so massive that it's actually causing islands to move out of their place. And the mountains were not found. Now, again, can I just say this? You see, the world is getting ready for the ultimate makeover. And the Lord has to demolish this present world, in a sense, before he rebuilds it in the millennial kingdom. And so already the earth is being altered radically. Soon the Lord is going to do a phenomenal remodeling job of the whole planet. And what he's doing, before you do a remodel, oftentimes you have to take some walls down, you have to do some changes. Well, this is the, this is the removal before the remodeling. God is shaking the earth. Remember Hebrews chapter 12, might good to remind ourselves of this. Hebrews 12, 26, it says, whose voice then shook the earth 
But now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word yet once more signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken, as of things that are made, that those things which shan cannot be shaken may remain. <laughs> God is shaking the things. He's going to shake up this planet so that the things that cannot be shaken will be established. They will remain. Well, we're not done because it says, as a follow-up to this great earthquake, it says, there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven. Every stone about the weight of a talent and men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. The earthquake is followed by a hailstorm of gigantic proportions. Now, again, we're, we're once again reminded of the plagues of Egypt. Uh, back in Exodus 9, uh, we saw this. We, we just read one verse from Exodus chapter 9 and verse 24. To show again that these are literal plagues. Exodus 9, it says, verse 24, So there was hail and fire mingled with hail, very grievous, such as there was none like it in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. And now there's hail once again. And God has told us that he has a secret armory. Back in the book of Job, if we just go there to Job chapter 38, we read this. God is telling us, I have got a special armory waiting for this day. Job 38, 22, has thou entered into the treasures of the snow? Or has thou seen the treasures of the hail, which I have reserved against the time of trouble, against the day of battle and war? So God is reserving this hail. Now, a hundred a talent, some have suggested, is 100 pounds weight or 45 kilograms. The largest recorded hail is around 20 pounds, which is 9 kilograms. So this is uh, significantly larger, five times larger than the largest hail that's ever fallen. Can you imagine a 100 pound weight, <laughs> 45 kilos, falling to the ground on people and you see when you when there's earthquakes everywhere what do people do when there's an earthquake we, we were in the philippines many years ago and there was a there was a massive earthquake on mount uh in in baguio and we were several miles away but our whole house was shaking and we literally what you do when there's an earthquake you get out of the building as quickly as you can so everybody when this earthquake occurs, that everybody that can gets out of the buildings. And then what? 100-pound <laughs> weights <laughs> of hail are falling to the ground. The treasures of the hail he's reserved till the day of battle. It's a frequent tool of judgment God has used against his enemies. Uh, we saw it in Egypt uh, against the Canaanites back in Joshua chapter 10. Uh, we'll just read it, but it's it's a frequent thing. It's part of God's methodology. This is how he wa wages war. He uses uh, his own armory that he has reserved for the day of battle. And Joshua 10 and verse 11 says, And it came to pass as they fled from before Israel uh, and were in the going down to Beth Horon, that the Lord cast down great stones from heaven upon them unto Azekah, and they died. There were more which died with hailstones than they whom the children of Israel slew with the sword. God defeats Gog and Magog again by using hailstones in Ezekiel 38 and verse 22. It says, And I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood, and I will rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many people that are with him an overflowing rain, and great hailstones, fire and brimstone. So God is pouring out these great judgments. We might say we have just looked at a great chapter. We've seen great evil. We've seen a great city. We've seen great Babylon. We've seen 
uh, great tools of judgment, a great heat, a great earthquake, great hail. And we've seen the coming of the battle of the day of God Almighty, which is going to be the greatest battle in human history. And we heard a great voice, a loud voice saying this, it is done. So we saw that Babylon came into remembrance before God. Next time we gather together, we're going to be given a lot more details about Babylon that came into remembrance before God. Because he wants us to realize why Babylon is the object of his hatred and his judgment. But until then, let us be those that are blessed because we watch and we keep our garments. <laughs> because the Lord is coming. And we better be ready for that day. Amen.